Big Sam Hobday was a very important man in Helena, Montana Territory. He wanted to be even more important and insisted that I write about him. This is what I wrote. Frontier Gentlemen. an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just one minute, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentleman. Did you fill up the gas tank of my swept wing Dodge? Yes, I did. That'll be 80 cents. She didn't need no oil or nothing. Okay, wipe off the windshield, will you? Yeah. <laughs> hey, this is some good windshield, boy. Yes, it's a Dodge picture window windshield. I can't reach the middle part, right up there where it curves back. Hold my ankles and boost me out on the hood. All right. Up uh, you go. My, this is a big car. I still can't reach all the windshield. Well, just walk out on the hood and finish it up. Okay. Boy, you must be rich to own a big car like this. Well, actually, Dodge costs less than 59 different models of the low price field. I just got all the car I was paying for. I forgot my squeegee. Here it is. Why, I could afford a Dodge. Come on, we'll see a Dodge dealer. Well, put up to the pump and I'll swing down. <laughs> Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. I had been four days in Helena, the capital of Montana Territory. It fascinated me, this lusty city, which owed its very existence to the discovery of gold. It was the evening of that fourth day that I was made aware of the fact that my presence in Helena was a newsworthy event. I was eating my dinner in the Hotel Colorado. Uh, Mr. Kendall? Yes? Uh, the name's Coleman. I don't think we've met. How do you do? I'm a manager of the hotel. Thought maybe you'd like to see this. Rocky Mountain Girl. Oh? Uh, right there, see? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Correspondent for the London Times visits our fair city. Yeah, that's you. Well, I wouldn't exactly say that... got the whole that... story about you and the kid and them cling jumpers you brought in a few days back. <laughs> it has. You know, we're mighty proud to have a visitor from foreign shores with us, Mr. Kendall. Uh, anything I can do for you, you just sing out. Uh, that's very kind of you, Mr. Coleman. Uh, will you be uh, staying a while? Oh, no, no. No definite plans. I'd like to do one or two stories from here. Yeah, kind of put Helena on the map if you did. Mm -hmm. uh, you might... Uh, Mention my hotel while you're at it if it's not too much trouble. No, no trouble at all, Mr. Coleman. That's fine. I, I'm obliged to you. Much obliged. Now, you be sure... Is something wrong? Those fellows just come in. Walking over to the bar, Ed Jeffers and Tucson Willie. Uh, Big Sam's boys. Big Sam? Hey, you've been here four days and you ain't here to Big Sam Hobday? No, should I? He kind of runs things, him and his boys. Got mixed up with the vigilantes a few years back, and, and nobody figured yet which side he was on. But when the shooting was finished, Big Sam was top dog in these parts. Well, I'm surprised I haven't met him. Uh, between you and me, Mr. Kendall, he's not the kind of man we hey, want. you. You, Kendall? Mm, yes, that's uh, right. <laughs> good evening, Ed. You shake your hocks, Coleman. Me and Tucson here, we want words with this fellow. Uh, sure, sure, Ed. That's fine. Uh, see you later, Mr. Kendall. Uh, you, uh... You want to talk to me? It ain't us, Kendall. Big Sam. Really? Big Sam? Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> I haven't finished my dinner. Well, you finish it when you get back, huh? Come on. But I rather an aversion to cold steak. What's he talking about? Aversion. What's aversion? How oh, come you ain't an educated to two two two? No, no, no. What, what you just mean, mean you don't like, like it? Oh. Uh, would you like to go over to the bar until I'm finished, and then possibly we can talk about it? Mister, I guess you just didn't hear me right. Big Sam wants to see you now. Mm. Well, 
You tell Big Sam I'll see him. He can come to the hotel in the morning. Man, you should not even think like that, let alone talk it. Hey, mm-hmm. Tucson, this place is getting real fancy. Look here. They lay a cloth on the table for a man to eat off it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I seen a fella do that once. He whooped the cloth off and not a dish was broke. It stayed right there on the table. I'm sorry you did that. Mister, you try and draw iron, I'm going to shoot you full of daylight. Uh, Tucson's got the drop on you, Kendall, for a fact. He's an awful fast gun. So I see. Hmm. This uh, friend of yours, Big Sam, he must be rather anxious to see me. Oh, sure. Big Sam just wants a nice, quiet talk. Ain't that so, Tucson? Yeah, yeah. So let's burn the breeze out of here. I was relieved of my gun, and we left the hotel. I noticed that most of the men passing by gave my companions a hurried nod and a wide berth as we made our way down Main Street toward a saloon. It was called a bonanza, and from the look of the business that was being transacted at both bar and gambling tables, the name was a fitting one. I was taken upstairs and shown into a quite gaudily furnished room. Sitting behind a table was one of the largest men I had ever seen, literally shoveling food into his mouth. Uh, lolling on a couch nearby, a woman of rather extraordinary proportions was sipping champagne. Oh, uh, Kendall, you had your dinner? And I was having it. Uh, there was a slight interruption. What's the matter, you Jerry? Ain't you got no manners? Well, it ain't our fault, Big Sam. He wasn't going to come. That's right. We, we had to persuade him. All right, go on, get out. Grab a chair, Kendall. All right, Millie, get a plate. Give Mr. Kendall some of them lamb fries. Best dog on lamb fries you ever ate, Kendall. Go ahead, sit down. This here's Millie. Best looking gal this side of Chicago. Hi. How do you do? Well, tell you what I want to see you about, Kendall. I figured you want to write something about me in that London paper yarn. Here's your lamb fries, Mr. Uh, Kendall. Hmm. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Champagne, Millie. All right. See, the Rocky Mountain Gazette says you're in town, Kendall. That was a fine thing you done for that kid the other day. Fine thing, yeah. No good sister Bill claim jumpers got what they had coming. <laughs> Should have hung them, though. What'd he do? I ain't read the paper. Shut your mouth, Millie. Where's your champagne? Here's your champagne, Mr. Kendall. Thank you. Now go lie down and don't bother us. So like I say, Kendall, I'm a pretty big man in these parts, and I figure folks read your paper and want to know. Well, is there something particularly interesting about you? I mean, huh? aside from the fact that you own what is obviously a successful business. <laughs> hey, mister. This town only breathes when I tell it to. Ain't that so, Mel? Sure. That's right, Mr. Kendall. I got myself one of the biggest strikes in the country. Taking out better than a million dollars. How's that? Congratulations. The saloon, that's just a sideline with me, uh... I'm a man that's going a long way, Kendall. You write about me, it'll help. Savvy? In what way? Well, I've been thinking about going in for politics, maybe being governor. Now, a story about me written right, it looked pretty good for folks here and in Washington reading what you say about me all the way over in England. Well, I, I'm afraid I couldn't be of much help. Why not? I don't write what people want me to write. I'll pay you a thousand. I don't think so. Thank you. Oh, sit down. You ain't even tasted your lamb fries. Some other time. Good night. Hi, Kendall. You going or staying, Big Sam? Staying. Well, now you go on back inside, huh? Tell you what, Kendall. I'll pay you $2,000. Easiest money you'll ever make. Sorry. Well, I'm being nice to you. I ain't used to people saying no to Big Sam. I'd say now's as good a time as any to start getting used to it. Mill, go to bed. I ain't sleepy. Get sleepy. Kendall and me want to be alone. Nice. Good night. She's a good gal. All right, what's your proposition? Uh, I, I haven't got one. Twenty-five hundred. No. Listen, boy, I run, Helena. You do what I say, 
Or? Ain't no use us whittle-wanging. I like you. Now, what do you want? A newspaper here in Helena? I'll buy you one. <laughs> You're wasting your time. Maybe you ain't hurt. It don't pay to get Big Sam Hobday on the prod. Uh, Hobday? I'm getting tired of this nonsense. You might as well get it through that skull of yours once and for all. I haven't any intention of writing a glorification of your political charms. Understand? Uh, then uh, I'm going to have to teach you why they call me Big Sam. Hmm? Maybe, maybe you understand now, huh? I have a, an overwhelming desire to see if that stomach of yours is as big a piece of blubber as I think it is. He must have weighed 280 pounds, but I found out very quickly that looks can be deceiving. There wasn't any fat on him. He was as hard as rock, and so were his fists. I vaguely remember getting in a beauty on his nose, and then something sloshed me over the left ear, and I was finished. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Today on CBS Radio, Everett Sloan stars in a thrilling drama about a big game hunt on suspense. You'll find excitement waiting for you, too, on our next high-tension episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Today and every Sunday, enjoy one fast-moving drama after another on most of these same stations. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. <laughs> I woke up to find myself lying in a very large bed. The lady named Millie billowed over me, applying a wet cloth to my head. Behind her, I could see Big Sam Hobday. He had a fat lip and looked worried. Hey, you come out of it, huh? Yes. Yes, so I have. I feel. I've got a headache. That Tucson, he could have killed you. Uh, Tucson? And it wasn't you? Ain't you never been pistol-whipped? Uh, him and Jeffers come busting in just when we was going good. And... Kendall, I sure do admire your punch. Uh, uh, ooh. I'm going to have to have a little talk with that gentleman. Oh, don't you worry none about that. I told him plenty. Yes, I'll bet that made an impression. Mill, go get Mr. Kendall some coffee. Sure. You just take it easy, Mr. Kendall. Millie will be right back with the coffee. Uh, sure glad to see you up. I uh, thought for a while you'd seen the pale horse. Uh, let's go into the room. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, how about a drink? Name your poison. Uh, brandy? Sure. You're all right, Kendall. And when Big Sam says so, it means something. Now, I, I want to do something for you. Yeah, I think you've already done more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're all right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how about it? How about what? You writing a piece on me? I thought we'd settle that. We ain't settled nothing. Uh, must we go through it again? I told you, I write only the way I see things, not as you or anybody else wants me to. Then y you ain't going to do it? Oh, I'll send a story about all this, but I don't think you'll like it. But you're stubborn as a bobtail mule. No doubt. Now, if I can have my gun, please, I'd like to go back to the hotel. You ain't going nowhere, Kendall. I've been real friendly to you, and I asked you a favor, polite and nice, and you turned me down. Well, I ain't asking no more. I'm telling you. Big Sam wants you to write what he says to write. <laughs> yes. Well, you tell Big Sam there's not a chance. Get out! Come on! That's the trouble with me. I get easy with folks like you. They take the bit in their teeth. Something you want, Big Sam? Well, sure, there's something I want. How can you figure I call you? Now, get some writing paper, quill and ink. Kendall here's going to work. Sure, sure. Tucson, you stay here. I'll be right back. How about you sit down, Kendall? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's 
fine. And don't you do nothing to make me shoot you. Because Big Sam will be awful mad. Ooh, perish the thought. Here's your coffee, Mr. Kendall. Thank you, Millie. You sure are welcome. Tucson, how come you're holding a gun on Mr. Kendall? I'm watching him for Big Sam. Oh. You know, Mr. Kendall, you should not wrangle with Big Sam. He's a real loving man when you get to know him, that is. Why don't you do like he says, huh? It'd make him real happy to be a governor. But it would make me very unhappy. Oh. Tucson, put away that gun. Look at here now, Kendall. I brought Sheriff Downer. He just happened to be passing by. Hello, Sheriff. Mr. Kendall, sure is nice seeing you again. You walked out so quick after bringing in them claim jumpers, I never did get a chance to properly thank you. Uh, Sheriff could tell you about me, Kendall. I could for a fact, Big Sam. Sheriff thinks I'd make a doggone good governor, don't you, Downer? Well, what I think ain't so much, Big Sam. It's the people that count. Now, you see? Now, we all know what a fine thing it'd be if that London Times, the Orn, says a lot of purry English words about Big Sam Hobday. Just a point of information. Sheriff, are you aware that I am being held here against my will? Oh, sure he is. As a citizen, I've been keeping you for the sheriff because you disturbed the peace. <laughs> I disturbed the peace? That's right. I invited you up for a peaceable talk and you jumped me. That's again the law in hell, and I ain't that right, Donner. If a man wants to bring a complaint, I guess it is. I'm a fair man. Don't hold no grudges. As far as I can see, no harm done. So you write what I want, and I don't swear out no complaint. <laughs> you know, if I didn't have more respect for the people I'd met in the territory, I'd do it. What does that mean? Uh, the answer is still no. Down and take him over to the jail. Oh, now, I got my rights. I'm sorry, Mr. Campbell. No, it's all right. And while we're at it, I want to serve a counter-complaint against Big Sam. <laughs> Same charge. <laughs> if I go to jail, he goes to... We'll settle it in court. Yeah. My word against his. Ain't a judge in town going to believe you, Kendall. I'm Big Sam. I'll take the chance. You arrest me, Sheriff. You arrest him, too. Yeah. He's in his rights, Sam. What do you mean in his rights? He ain't got no rights. You do like I say, Downer. We're getting a new sheriff. Well, I got to uphold the law, Sam. If I take him, I got to take you. He's made a complaint. Downer, you get me hog wild. I'm mighty sorry, Sam. You going to do like I say? Well, I I can't. I swore to uphold the law. Took an o You remember when I was swore in? I'm warning you, Downer. It don't make no difference. All right. I found papers. Hey, well, what's the matter with the sheriff? You and Tucson lay him on the bed inside. Mill, go take care of him. Felt like maybe I broke his jaw, poor fella. Now, Kendall, you see how it is around here. Why don't you just fall off and cool your saddle and write your piece? The boys will keep you company. Jeffers? Yeah? I'm going downstairs for a while. You and Tucson keep an eye on things. Kendall, you have that finished when I get back, you hear? You heard what Big Sam told you? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Now, how's the sheriff? He's fine. Didn't break a thing. He'll be coming around. Now, you get going, huh? I'll put the paper and quill there on the table. I may need some help. What kind of help? Oh, things about Big Sam's background, his past. Well, Tucson here can tell you. You've been with him longer than me. Good. Now, um, where was he born? Kansas, I guess, as near as I can remember. Uh, Kansas, huh? How old is he? Ed, how old is he? I don't know. No. He never said. What did he do before he came to Helena? Well, lots of things. 
Well, maybe he wouldn't want you to write. <laughs> Helpful. I'll just use my imagination. I began to write flowery, revolting nonsense. Tucson came closer, leaning over my shoulder. From time to time, I asked him a question. I knew if I could take him off guard for just a moment, it would give me a chance to get his gun. I had filled almost two pages when the time came. Well, now, what do you think of this, Tucson? In Montana Territory, the flower of manhood has reached its uh, perfect perfection That's right. That's right. in the mining town of Helen. I refer to a stal stalwart. Stalwart citizen who bears and with good breeze. Hey, where are you going? Put your hands high over your head, Jeffers. Ah, I'll take your gun if you don't mind. Another patient for you, Florence Nightingale. Pick him up, Jeffers. Take him in there. Kendall. Big Sam ain't gonna like this. I have an idea there'll be quite a few things Big Sam won't like. This is the least of them. Move over here, honey. You got company. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me up. <laughs> Millie, you souse him with water. Get him awake. I'm arresting him. And you, Jeffers. Big Sam, too. Mr. Kendall, I'll ask you to be a witness at the trial. My pleasure, Sheriff. And I hear you can't arrest Big Sam. Listen, boy. Maybe I ain't the best sheriff in the country, but there ain't a man alive gonna bust me in the jaw and get away with it. Oh, he didn't mean nothing, Sheriff. He's just a big, playful puppy. Kendall! Tucson! Give her! Shall we break the news to the playful puppy? Sam, I'm arresting you for doing me a bodily harm. You're fired, Donner. I'm firing you right now. Roll your blankets and pull freight out of here. We'll let the judge decide that. The judge did decide, strangely enough, against Big Sam and his boys. Seven days in jail and $200 fine. It was a small thing, but it broke Sam Hobday's hold on Helena. The whole town stood against him, and he knew it. I sent the story off to the Times, but I don't think that it will improve Big Sam's chances for governorship of Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jack Crucian, Stacey Harris, Vic Perrin, Gene Carson, Harry Bartell, and Charles Seal. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Now stay tuned for the Ford Road Show, which follows immediately over most of these same stations. And join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network. It's amazing what a man will do to himself over a woman, and still more amazing what a woman will do to herself over a man. This story happened in Virginia City, Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen.
Herewith, an Englishman's account of life and death in the West. As a reporter for the London Times, he writes his colorful and unusual stories. But as a man with a gun, he lives and becomes a part of the violent years in the new territories. In just one minute, we will bring you this latest report from the Frontier Gentleman. What are you stopping here for, Clark? The country club is still a half mile away. I know, Scarlett, but I don't want to drive up to the club in this low-priced car. But the snow is six inches deep, and I'm wearing my ballerina slippers. Well, you'll just have to hoof it, baby. I'm not driving any further. You're much too big for piggyback. Oh, the snow is cold. Take bigger steps. Oh, that won't help. Why don't you get a big car like a swept wing Dodge? A Dodge? I can't afford a big car like that. Oh, yes, you can. Even though Dodge is a big car, it's priced below 59 different bottles of the low-priced field. What? You mean I can own a big swept-wing Dodge for less than I paid for my car? That's right. And you get all that big car roominess and big car luxury. With a Dodge, you get all the car you're paying for. Okay, Scarlett. Let's forget the Dodge, dear, and go see our Dodge dealer. Oh, wonderful, darling. On these cold feet, who could dance anyway? Now, starring John Daner, this is the story of J.B. Kendall, Frontier Gentleman. Virginia City, Montana Territory, was particularly noted for three things. It's gold, Henry Plummer and his band of outlaws, and the vigilantes. The vigilantes disposed of the plumbers and were replaced by a more lawful authority, so that by the time I arrived, only the gold remained, and of course those who sought it, the miners. They filled the town day and night, spending their hard or easily won money in saloons, gambling houses, and hurdy-gurdy establishments. I was attracted to one of these on the night of my second day in Virginia City. It was a brilliantly lit saloon called Skinner's, and outside was a large sign proclaiming the appearance of Miss Eulalia Robinson. I went inside. guns in the establishment, because the next man that does it is going to get thrown out on his saddle. With your kind permission, I have the honor of presenting the world-famous actress, Miss Eulalia Robinson. She has appeared before the crown heads of Europe and honors us with a presence tonight by a special appointment to Her Majesty, the Queen of England. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Henry Irvin's leading lady, Miss Eulalia Robinson. <laughs> For her first recitation, Miss Robinson will give us a scene from William Shakespeare's play... Romeo and Juliet. Thou knowest the mask of night is on my face. Else would a maiden blush be paint my cheek. For that which thou hast heard me speak tonight. Fain would I dwell on She was in her late thirties. Not a good actress. Not even beautiful. But her manner, the dignity of carriage, created an illusion of beauty which captivated her audience. She remained on the stage for a solid hour, and by the time she was finished, I could see that every man in that saloon was completely taken by her. And more than one imagined himself to be hopelessly in love. to meet her. Who goes? Hey, find a way to meet her. 
Mr. Skinner? Yeah? My name is Kendall. What? Uh, Kendall. Kendall? Yes, that's right. I'd like to meet Miss Robin. Yeah, you and a hundred more will tear the place down. Now, I'm a correspondent for the London Times, a uh, newspaper. Newspaper man? Yes. Uh, sure, come on. Duck under here. How'd you like it? That's real culture, huh? Well, she's quite a success. Yeah, she sure is. What, uh, what paper did you say you write for? London Times. Well, that's so. Well, Miss Robinson will get a kick out of that. You and her both coming from England. Oh, that was just fine, Miss Robinson, real fine. Say, this is Mr. Kendall. He writes on the London Times. Mr. Kendall. How do you do? May I present my business associate, Mr. Grimes? How are you, Mr. Grimes? I guess you folks have plenty to talk about. I'll go on back and get the boys quieted down. Virginia City never heard anything like you gave us tonight, Miss Robinson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Skinner. Not at all. I'll see you later. Well, won't you sit down, Mr. Kendall? Oh, wait a minute. Uh... Kendall, you got uh, identification or something? Proving you're a correspondent? Uh, not on me, no. I don't think it really matters. Well, it does to me. You know what I mean, Kendall. Miss Robinson is popular. A lot of fellas like to come busting in and make any excuse, you know what I mean. I gotta watch out for her interests. I understand. And she's kind of tired right now. Why don't you let her go to tomorrow? If you'd rather, Miss Robinson? No, not at all. I'd rather enjoy being interviewed tonight. And I say it's not a good idea. You're being extremely rude, James. Perhaps you'd care to take supper with me, Mr. Kendall. Why, well, I'd be delighted. No. No? No, no, she's not gone. I hope you'll forgive me, Mr. Kendall. He thinks that every man who looks at me is thinking dire and dreadful for <laughs> My intentions are completely honorable, Mr. Grimes. Lately. I don't want I... to discuss it anymore, James. Now, both of you, please wait outside. I must change my clothes. I shan't be a moment, Mr. Kendall. Uh, listen, Kendall. I'm sorry I acted the way I did, but... If I don't keep an eye on her, nobody's going to. You know what I mean? I think so. I mean, nothing personal, but... Uh, as her business manager, I've got to take care of things. Now, she gets awful tired traveling around this way. Best thing for her right now is to go back to the hotel and get some sleep. As a business manager, Mr. Grimes, I should think you'd be happy to have a newspaper interview. Oh, sure, sure I am. But you know how these actresses are. They're like kids. They don't even know what's good for them. I hadn't been aware. Well, take my word for it. So you go on ahead. Now, I'll, I'll tell her you'll see her tomorrow. Under the circumstances, I'm afraid she'd think it was rather impolite, don't you? Uh, why not wait until she comes out? All right, we'll make it tonight. A nice quiet supper at the hotel, three of us. Mr. Grimes, I get the distinct impression that for some reason or other you don't want me to be alone with Miss Robinson. Am I right? I'm her business manager. So you said. And she doesn't talk to anyone unless I'm around. Strange, I got the impression that she didn't want you around. I don't care what you think. I'm coming along if you don't like it, no inter... There, that didn't take long, did it? Are we ready, Mr. Kendall? Yes. Laylee, you're going back to the hotel. Good night, James. I'll see you in the morning. We walked down the street to the hotel. She talked about some of her experiences in the territory, rather nervously, I thought, seeming almost deliberately to avoid her background of successes in England. I ordered champagne with dinner, and I could see that rather than making her feel more at ease... The drink only increased her anxiety. I'm afraid that James is right, Mr. Kendall. I must be tired. Champagne makes me feel quite giddy. But I will have just a tiny drop more. Of course. You know, James is very angry with me. <laughs> I gathered that. He's a jealous man. You wouldn't think so, would you? But he is. I don't think I blame him. He has no reason to be. We're only business associates. It's not as though we were married or anything. James doesn't believe in marriage. He says it deadens one. Do you think so? I don't know. I've never been married. My work hasn't allowed for it. Did you meet Grimes in England? Oh, no. No, uh, that was in Boston. He saw me perform and asked to represent my interests. I see. Oh, he'll be very angry about this. Me being with you tonight. May I ask you something? Please. Why are you afraid of him? Afraid? Afraid of James? How utterly ridiculous. Does it show so very clearly? Yes. 
May I have some more champagne? You know I'm not English, don't you? Yes. I never played with Henry Irving. Never saw England. Never did any of the things they say I did. I didn't think so. By appointment to Her Majesty. Jane thought that sounded fine. He took it from a bottle of Scotch whiskey. Do you know what I am, Mr. Kimball? I'm a liar. My whole life is a lie. I'm not even a good actress. I was completely charmed by your performance. How sweet. How gentlemanly and nice you are. Mr. Kendall, you're terribly attractive. You're the most attractive man I've ever met. No. No, that's not true. My husband was the most attractive man. You see, I lied about that, too. You are married. I was. James is always afraid I'll tell someone. Why? Well, the, the marriage didn't end very nicely. Why do you tell me? <laughs> too much champagne. Mm, I don't think so. I'm tired, then. I wish I could cry. Do you know, Mr. Kendall? I haven't been able to cry for three years. And there are so many tears. The shots had come from outside. Just for a moment, I saw a shadowy figure at the broken window. Then it was gone in the night. Miss Robinson was lying on the floor. A thin line of blood ran from the corner of her mouth. She was unconscious. In a moment, we return to Frontier Gentlemen. Today on CBS Radio's Suspense, Vanessa Brown and Jim Amici will co-star in Affair at Loveland Pass, a Western thriller with a psychological twist. Exciting dramas waiting for you, too, on yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Join us on most of these same stations later today as action-packed stories come your way on CBS Radio's Suspense and yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now we return you to the Anthony Ellis production of Frontier Gentlemen. Sure, Mr. Skinner. The doctor's on his way. I'll be here in a few minutes. Oh, she doesn't look good. I think the bleeding stopped. The boys down in the saloon are mad. Words got around here in a lynching mood. Sheriff's trying to ease him down. And Mr. Skinner, was was Mr. Grimes there? I didn't see him. Uh, I just wondered. I guess he ought to be told. He's staying down at Nugget Hotel. Yes, it might be a good idea. Well, I'll, I'll go on down myself. Now, listen, Mr. Kendall... If there's anything she needs, you sing out. Anything at all. One of my boys will be outside. You just say the word. Right. I'll be back. What a strange feeling. Miss Robinson? No pain at all. I've always thought there would be. The doctor is coming. I don't really mind, you know. Don't talk. Funny. I never believed him. He always threatened to do something like this. Dr. Todd, where's the wound, please? Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, kindly wait outside, sir. Yes, sir. I'm Dave. Skinner told me to wait. What's the doc say? Nothing yet. I'd sure like to get my hands on that fella at Dunn. Yeah. I imagine a lot of us would. She's a lady. A fine lady. Not like them herdy gerties around here. It don't matter if one of them stops a piece of lead. She real bad hurt? Pretty bad. You figure it was some crazy liquored up son of a gun, Donnie? I, I don't know if he was drunk or not. I mean the fellas would come to see how the lady is. We don't know yet. There's more downstairs. 
We just wanted to know we're going to get the son of a gun to dry golf, sir. Doc Todd come yet? He's in there now. Well, you give him this. There's $300 of better gold dust than that. You tell Doc he pulls her through, he'll get another like it. The boys wanted to know they're with her. Sure is. I'll tell her. You do that. I got a couple of dollars. That goes for me, too. Give it to the doc. I will. I can't operate yet. She's lost too much blood. She's going to be all right, huh, Doc? Don't ask fool questions, boy. I'm not God. Right now, she's asleep. Well, you're you're Kendall, aren't you? Yes. Lucky for her you were around. If she'd lost any more blood, she'd be dead. Well, you might as well get some shut eye. I'll stay with her. I left the hotel and went out into the street. There were 50 or 60 men standing about, quietly waiting. I told them all that I knew. Then I saw Mr. Skinner hurrying up. He motioned to me, and we walked away from the crowd. Grimes, couldn't find him. Oh? Hotel clerk said he hadn't seen him all night. Now, I've been thinking. Is there something wrong between these two? I heard arguing this afternoon in her dressing room over at the saloon. I didn't think anything of it then, but with this... I think we'd better find him, Mr. Skinner. He did it? I don't know, but it's possible. I'll get some of the boys. Uh, No. What's the matter? Are you a friend of his? You trying to protect him? Neither one, but all they need is an excuse. If they even suspect someone, they'll hang him. I prefer things more legal. He's a killer. We've handled that kind before in Virginia City. Miss Robinson is not dead. No, what I suggest is that you talk to some of the men who aren't likely to take matters into their own hands. Tell them we're trying to find Grimes. If he doesn't know what's happened to Miss Robinson, they can bring him back here. Then what? We'll let the sheriff handle it. All right. But I'll tell you, Kendall... If he puts up a fight, I want to be there. It'll be a pleasure to shoot him. The search began. At first, only a handful, picked by Skinner, knew what they were looking for. But the word spread, and with it, rumor. Grimes was the man. Grimes had done it. In an hour, every man who knew or cared about what had happened was a hunter. The quarry, innocent or guilty, was James Grimes. And it was obvious that if found, he'd have very little chance of standing trial. At about three o'clock in the morning, I returned to Miss Robinson's room. Any change, Doctor? No. They get the fellow that did it? Not yet. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? How come a man would want to kill a woman like this? She's the way I remember a woman should be. Why don't you get a cup of coffee, Doctor? I'll stay with her until you come back. I think I will. Stretch my legs a minute. Huh, Turn around, Kendall. Don't move. You look a little worse for wear, Grimes. Well, they're after me. They're trying to kill me. Any reason why they shouldn't? Is she dead? No. I warned her. I've been warning her what had happened. Put away the gun. And get myself killed? You'll be safer with me than the mob outside. You! You're the trouble. The reason for everything. It's been men like you everywhere we go. Every town she has to find someone. I warned her. I told her I wasn't going to stand it any longer. Well, I heard a different reason. A different reason? What did she tell you? About her husband. An unhappy marriage. She said that? Told you about her husband? Yes. You want to know what really happened? She had a husband, all right, in Boston. I didn't know it at the time. I met her. I fell in love. She went away with me. After we were married, she told me. She... She is your wife? Surprising. Look at her. It's another one of her little ways. She thinks it's better if people don't know. She thinks I don't know why she wants it that way. I guess you could say we killed her husband. He committed suicide after she left him. Oh, you don't know. You don't know what it's been like. But I told her what I'd do if she went after another man. I'm sorry. It doesn't matter anymore. 
I hope she dies. Then I won't have to feel these things. If she dies, they'll hang you. Yeah. Mm. Mm. James? Lely. I'm sorry, Lely. Such a jealous boy. I never meant anything. Don't. Don't, Lely. I like to flirt. That's all. A woman likes to flirt. It doesn't mean anything. Mr. Kendall knows that. Can't you stop acting? Even now, can't you stop? Listen to him, Mr. Kendall. Has he been telling you what a terrible woman I am? I suppose it's true. But you're not much of a man, James. Really? You don't have to listen to this crime. Come outside. No, no, you don't. Give me the gun. Give me the gun. Lady. Lady. She's dead. Give me my gun. I can't. You'll get a trial. Perhaps they'll understand. There'll be no trial. No, Grimes. Come back. Grimes. Grimes! I think I was rather glad I hadn't stopped Grimes when he went through the window. They killed him. But in this case, perhaps it was better than a public trial and hanging. Miss Eulalia Robinson and James Grimes were buried side by side in Virginia City, Montana Territory. Frontier Gentlemen was written, produced, and directed by Anthony Ellis and stars John Daner as J.B. Kendall. Featured in the cast were Jeanette Nolan, Larry Dobkin, Harry Bartell, Jack Moyles, and Jim Nusser. Music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Now stay tuned for the Ford Road Show to be followed by the CBS News over most of these same stations. Join us again next week for another report from the Frontier Gentlemen. John Wall speaking. This is the CBS Radio Network.